Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, and today's uh, theme is Judge Righteously, or Rightly. Uh, Billy Graham is quoted saying, It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict, God's job to judge, and my job to love, to love. Do you agree with Billy Graham? Would you agree with Billy Graham that it is the Holy Spirit who convicts? I agree with that. It is God's job to judge. Yes, I agree with that. And our job to just love. I'm not quite sure about that last one. Yes, we're to love. Definitely, uh, love should be a, a part of every decision that we make, every judgment that we uh, give. But I think that we also have a responsibility to judge or to at least be fruit inspectors of what's going on around us. But I think those judgments have to be weighed very carefully and, and prayerfully before you just make those judgment calls because you can offend, you can destroy, you can you can create enemies at the same time. Has anyone ever told you that you have no right to judge them? We've all heard those words before. You have no right to judge me. Look at your life. I used to get that in the beginning of my Christian walk when I first got saved because I lived a pretty radical life. Uh, I was a drinker. I was a partier. Um, did what I wanted to do. Left my family alone. Uh, did my own thing. And when I came to Christ and I began to point those things out to others, the first thing they'd say, you have no right to judge me. You did it all the time. You know, yes, I know. I know and I wish I didn't because now you're using it against me. But I did and that doesn't make it right. And I have repented from that. I don't want to do that anymore. And I'm help, trying to help you understand that you need Jesus Christ in your life. Uh, that he died for your sins and even the things that you're doing now that will ultimately lead you to destruction. And that's what I found, that the things that I did in the past, the things that I was doing, those things were leading me to destruction, the destruction of my marriage, my family, and so forth. And I don't want that to happen to you, but they don't understand that. They just understand, you're judging me, and you have no right to judge me. So in this chapter, Jesus gives his constitution, again, the Sermon on the Mount. He's giving us what he believes uh, we should uh, apply to our lives as Christians, uh, pertaining to our relationship here, specifically in this chapter, to man, our relationship to man, how we judge our, our brothers and our sisters and how we judge the world. And I think you would agree that we make judgment calls all the time, but... I think you would also agree that there are times where we don't want to make a judgment call. We want to stay out of it. We don't want our opinion to be heard. And so we're too uh, scared of what may happen. We're too scared of offending. And so we're very careful at not saying anything. And oftentimes, believers just kind of stand on the side and just kind of, you know, lower their head and just accept what was said. Not agreeing with it, but won't really confront the situation. So he discussed the acts of passing judgment on others and what God has to say about proper judgment. God's desire, <clears throat> that God desires that we, like him, make loving judgments. And, and we'll talk about that in a moment too, because we do have to be like him. We have to make those loving judgments. We're not to put on a show of spirituality or to impress anybody or you know to excite them that that we're some pious you know person but that that we really have a genuine uh, care for them we should seek god's approval rather than man's acceptance though always looking to uh, get our approval from god so the sermon on the mount is really a profound message as we've been going through this it's a life-changing message and it really gives us some direction on how to live our life here and so i encourage you to to continue to read through it and and see where god would have you change some of the things in your own life up to this point uh, matthew has been very clear to present jesus as the king we saw that in chapter one his ancestry the genealogy of jesus christ chapter two was his birth his incarnation God becoming man chapter 3 we saw his announcement as the king his announcement by Herod by the Jews and even by the the shepherds themselves and then now Jesus has been spending time uh, on his throne there in the sermon on the mount giving his constitution as a king we saw chapter 6 ending with worrying which is interesting because now we come to judging. And when we're judging, we always worry on how people are going to receive uh, that judgment. And that's a big issue. And so he ends, ends with the outward activities that, that we as believers uh, endure from time to time, like worrying. Worrying is a big issue in our lives. We worry about a lot of things. But Jesus was very clear that we should not worry, that we should just trust in him. 
and make sure that we're following his orders. Chapter 7 deals with proper judging. So Jesus returns from a negative attitude, uh, one about worrying, and then he continues on with a negative attitude about one's worrying about judging and how they judge. So proper judging, proper judging. Let's go ahead and read the text so we get the context of what's going on here. And that's so important because people, especially in the world, and you may have used this in the past, will take one scripture and even one statement and they will use it as a proof text for their truth. And you just can't do that. You can't do that. There's a text that says, uh, in the scriptures, I heard a story of a guy that uh, just wanted to know the Lord's will, and so he was going through the Bible, and all of a sudden he read a statement that said, what you do, go and do quickly. He said, oh, wow, okay, God's speaking to me. I need to do this very quickly. What I do, I need to do quickly. And he turned the pages again to see what the Lord wanted him to do, and it says, and Judas Iscariot went and hung himself. And he's like, oh, I don't want to do that. So you can't do that because you can get into big trouble if you you just pick and choose what you want to read. You have to read it in its context. So verses 1 through 6 is dealing with judging and having a proper judgment. You just can't pull out verse 1 and say, aha, judge not. The Bible says judge not. So let's not ever judge the world. Let's not ever judge sin. Let's not be a part of that because the Bible says judge not. But it also says that you may not be judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, <clears throat> do you, or, or, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye, hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs or cast your pearls before swines, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So that's the context, and you have to take that whole context to understand proper judgment. Let me ask you a question. Do you or do we have the right to judge others? You don't have to answer that. But do we have the right to judge others? And then who am I, who am I to judge anyone? Am I some important dignitary? Has God given me some authority that I have the right to judge others? And are there different types of judgments? Are there different types of judgments? Yes, there is. We make judgments every day. You made a judgment to wake up in the morning and to put on some clothes, put on your makeup, comb your hair, and get here to hear God's word. Those are judgment calls. Uh, You made a judgment to listen to the radio or listen to TV. You're making a judgment call whether uh, this is the church God wants you or whether it's somewhere else that God... We're making judgment calls all the time. Uh, what you listen to, what we don't listen to, what we watch, what we don't watch, uh, who we want to hang around with, who we don't want to hang around with, who we want our kids to hang around with, who we don't want them to hang around with. You know, there are judgment calls all the time. Do we believe that this woman should have issued a, a license to them or do we not believe that she should have issued a license? Whether we believe in Jesus or whether we don't believe in Jesus, we are constantly making judgments. And so we need the wisdom to make right judgments. Can we make judgments in the church itself with the body of Christ? I think we can, and and Paul proves that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Can we judge the world? It's interesting. Can we judge the world? Uh, We'll see that we really can't because the world is what? Already judged as far as condemnation. As condemnation. The judge asked Marty, if you've ever been to uh, a jury duty, uh, judge asked Marty uh, Lan, the prospective juror, is there any reason why <clears throat> you could not serve as a jury on this case? And he says, I do not want to be away from my job, uh, replied Mr. Lan. Uh, Can't they get along without you? And so Marty answered, I'm sure that they can, and I don't want them to realize it. And so that why <laughs> was the reason he didn't want to serve on jury duty. This section of the Bible is very controversial. Again, I totally understand that, especially when it comes to judging sin in the lives of people. They don't want to be judged. They don't want to feel inferior. They don't want to feel as though they've done something wrong. But in reality, brothers and sisters, God wants us to remove sin from our lives. And there are times where where God has to humble us to see our weaknesses so that we can depend upon him for our strengths. 
The word judge in itself is mentioned 98 times in the New Testament. And judge can mean to decide something, or even to distinguish between one thing or another, good or bad, or even condemnation. Now we're not to condemn, that's God's job to condemn. And ultimately, as as John said in John chapter 3, that the world is what? Already condemned. And so we can't condemn the world. They're already condemned. They're already in, on death row. They're already heading to hell. And so what we do is we come and offer them the light, the pardon in a sense that through Jesus Christ. Now, it deals with judging others' actions as condemnation and judging. We hear sayings like who am i to judge someone or who are you to judge me and and these issues need to be dealt with and these verses do not imply that we cannot judge others works or their fruits Uh, turn to first corinthians chapter 5 and i want to just give you a clear picture of proper judging and here's a situation where where a couple were in church and they were sinning uh, within the church and Paul had to deal with uh, that issue of sinning. And it's a clear picture, almost uh, pretty much all the way down through the whole chapter of proper judging from, from Paul himself, judging those in the church, judging those that are leadership in the church and how they had a lack of judgment, uh, and then also how we are supposed to judge those in the church, but those outside the church, those that are in the world, those that are not believers in Christ Jesus, their brothers, we are not to judge them because, again, they're already judged. So look at verse 1. It says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. So that's the sin right there. Uh, Pretty extreme. And you are puffed up. Now he's speaking to leadership. You are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed am absent from the body, but present in the spirit, have already judged as though I were present concerning him who has done or so done this deed. So he, he reprimands the leadership. You should have done something. You should have been mourning over this situation, but you have it. I'm not there, but my spirit's there, and I've already judged them for their actions. In the name of the Lord Jesus, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This is the judgment. Take them and cast them out that that God will deal with them. And if he needs to destroy their flesh, he will destroy their flesh. That will be God's responsibility. But you need to cast them out, let them deal with their sin. Um, And if their flesh is destroyed, then at least their souls will be saved in the day of judgment. Your glory, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? What does he mean by that? Your glorying is not good. What he's saying was that they, they, were, they were basically saying, look, we have so much grace, we're allowing this in our church. We're, we're loving and caring people that we're not judging these things. And so they're glorying in that characteristic. And Paul said, nah, that's wrong. That's wrong. Because a little bit of leaven as Jesus said himself, will leaven the whole lump. It will destroy a church. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with leaven of malice, uh, with wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexual and moral people. So as believers, we're not to keep company with them. Yes, I certainly did not mean with sexually immoral people of this world. Ah, there's a distinction there. So in the church, it's different compared in the world. Now, can I have homosexual friends? Yeah. Well, but I'm not supposed to keep company with sexual moral people in the church. Can I have Christian believers who say they're homosexual partners as friends? No, because if they call themselves believers and they know the truth, they're not going to live that lifestyle. They're going to fight every inch of the way to get out of that lifestyle, and we're to help them by not having fellowship with them until they come and repent from that. Now, that seems harsh. I know it does. I really do. I understand it totally. But God has a way of 
chastening his children and he will do it. Um, I'm one that wants to apply the word of God to my life and there are times where I apply certain things that are very difficult. Normally people won't apply them but I want to, sometimes I want to see the outcome of it. I've applied this to my life in in one situation where someone was actually living with someone, a close relative of mine that I love dearly and I decided I'm going to not have fellowship with them anymore. And so, boy, my sisters were mad when I did that. They called me unloving. So how could you be a pastor? And they're, they're, they're Christians too. You know, that that's not a pastor, that's not loving, but I did it. Um, and it was for a short while because the person loved me more than they loved that other individual that they said, I can't take this, that you won't come over and you won't fellowship and so forth. And so they gave up that relationship. And I believe it's because truly they were believers, and ultimately the Holy Spirit will convict the person and they will return to the right relationship with Christ. Now, but what if someone doesn't? Uh, the question mark of whether they're really a believer then because I think God's children will always come back. Now, I also applied another one that caused problems too. There was, there's a scripture, um, let the dead bury the dead. You know that one where Jesus is talking about about uh, coming following him and this is well first let me go bury my my father and my mother and so forth and I, I applied that one you, you ever apply that one to your life where, where someone's funeral is taking place and and you know they expect you to be there and, and you just felt like God saying let the dead bury the dead and that's how I felt and I applied it and boy did that cause a lot of problems in my <laughs> in my life but pu- try try to apply the scriptures by your convictions and watch who your friends really are and whether they respect your convictions or not. And most likely, they don't. And most likely, they won't apply those scriptures either to their lives. So here's a, here's a scripture that Paul applied. He told them to apply. Um, and obviously, uh, we see the results of it is that they did uh, later apply. And he goes on in verse 11, But now I have written to you not to keep company uh, with anyone named a brother who is a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? Who's inside? The brothers, the believers. Who are outside? The non-believers. But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves that wicked person. So God judges the world. Uh, They're already condemned. Um, We don't have to worry about judging them. What we have to do is present the truth to them, the gospel, and hopefully they'll repent and and turn back to God. Judging matters in the church is very important. In fact, if you go on in verse uh, 1 of chapter 6, it continues to talk a little bit more about uh, judging. Let's go ahead and turn back to to Matthew, looking at verse 1. Many of us don't like to judge, and the reason is is that we don't like to be judged. And so we don't want to be judged ourselves, and so we don't make those judgment calls because we can create enemies. So he says, judge not that you be not judged. Now the word judge there in both cases are a, a negative opinion of someone by some outward appearance. So the judgment call that his person is making is based upon what he sees. And what he sees, he then tries to make a right judgment. And, and Jesus here is saying, look, when you judge, judge not. But when you judge, judge rightly, that you may not be judged. And so you have to have a right judgment. Um, and what he's talking about here is a judgment of condemnation. We can't condemn the world. They're already condemned. And we can't condemn a believer because they're not condemned. They're saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And so we can't condemn a believer. You might feel condemned if someone judges you because they're saying that's not how a believer lives. Oh, so you're saying I'm going to hell now. No, I didn't say that. (laughs) What I'm saying is you're not living like a believer and and they don't like that. And so now I'm going to hell. Okay, well, he's condemning me. No, I don't have a right to condemn. Only God has a right to condemn because God sees the very heart of an individual that he can condemn that person. So he says, so judge not, least you be judged too. Then in verse 2, he goes on, he says, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So he's very clear here in verse 1, in verse 2 of what he meant in verse 1. 
So that when, with the judgment that you use, it will be measured back to you and how you judge. And so when you judge, when you make those judgments, you have to be very careful in how you make those. See, God is going to ultimately judge to condemnation. He sets those standards for us on how to judge and when to judge and with what attitude to judge. If someone judges another person harshly, God says that he will then judge us harshly. And so that would encourage us to be very careful in how we make our judgments, right? I know I am. So when I'm looking at an individual and they're struggling with something, one of the first things I ask myself, am I dealing with that sin? Is that something that I have dealt with in the past or am even dealing with now? Am I struggling with it? So I totally understand. So I have to now approach him. Hey, I totally understand what you're going through. I know that sin can be very difficult and hard. And so I want to encourage you, you know, maybe through prayer, we can pray together, get together, whatever it is that we can do to restore you in the right relationship. That's how you judge. Uh, if you're a person who says, hey, what you're doing is wrong and you're going to be going to hell possibly if you do that, then no, that's not the right way to approach that situation. We should not judge presumptuously. We need to know all the facts. We need to know the heart. We need to know the situation. Are they struggling with it even? You know, maybe they're struggling with them. It's a sin that they've been struggling with for a long time. And we come along and just, boom, just hit them over the head with a mallet. You know, And that doesn't always work. Uh, Romans 14.4 says, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. And we have to understand that ultimately it's God who is the master of that person, and we're there to restore them in our judgments, not to condemn them. Um, God is the one working in their lives through the Holy Spirit. Uh, we should not judge um, without understanding their motives first, as I said. Kim Davis you know, there's a lot of judgment calls. Uh, Christians who are, you know, I've, she, she under, you know, I heard someone say she understands what she was getting into. She should have just quit her job and go somewhere else. I've heard that uh, statements uh, made. You know, this is what she gets paid for, so she needs to just do her job. You know, I've heard those things made, you know. Uh, but she's also a believer. She has convictions. Even the president has convictions. Uh, whether it's Obama or whether it was Bush, he had Christian convictions, and he ran the country with those Christian convictions, and he has every right to do so. Obama has has communist <laughs> convictions, you know, and and he he's trying to get the country under those same convictions, you know, whether they whether they are, are truthful with themselves, you know, without looking at themselves. And, and Jesus will talk about this in a minute. Minute here is first look at yourself, and then see what you're really doing. They don't look at themselves. All they see is, you know. Um, I want my rights and I have my ideas and thoughts. And so just like those uh, same-sex couples that are there at the counter and are demanding her, you need to do this, you need to, this is, you have no right. You know, this is not a religious system and, and so forth. And they're demanding their rights. And, and they're not seeing that she has rights too. You know, and if if she feels convicted, then, you know, Kim, can you put a, move aside and just get me someone that will issue this? Because we really love each other and we just want to go get married. But that's not the motive, is it? They really want to cram it down the Christian's face. So, Understanding the motive. We should not judge hypocritically either. Romans 2, 1 says, Therefore you are inexcusable, man, whoever you are who judges. For in whatever you judge, another to condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same thing. So again, be careful. Be careful how you judge. We should not judge harshly or rashly. Do not judge according to the appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Um, take your time. Pray. Seek the Lord. You know, humble yourself before him. And don't just uh, come right out. And again, uh, the whole purpose is to, to restore the individual. We should not judge according to our own non-scriptural convictions. That is so difficult, isn't it? Because we've all been raised in, in different families. We've been raised in, in a different part of society, different ethnic backgrounds. And so we have our own little convictions and so forth. And they might not be the convictions of someone else. And so we need to respect one another's convictions of the word. Unless it's blatant, like Paul said, you know, uh, fornicators and adulterers and revilers. Unless it's very clear drunkards you know then other than that then we need to be careful that we're not uh, infringing on on what they feel is right or wrong in their lives Paul, Paul or no James even said that if you know to do right and you don't do it it's sin unto you 
And so if you know to do something and you don't do it, that's sin. And so there is a place where God allows us the liberties and the grace to work in our own personal lives and what we had conviction. So, some can sit around someone and, and drink alcohol. That's fine, but some can't. And so you have to understand that and have, have the grace and understanding not to put someone else in, in those situations either. So harshly or rashly <clears throat> and spiritual convictions too. We should not judge unfairly or according to our prejudices. We should not judge unmercifully. We are to judge the actions and not not the person itself. And you always hear that. You know that. You know, we are not judging the person. We're judging the sin. And the sin is what uh, is wrong in an individual's life. So he goes on and now he asks two questions. He asks two questions here. And these questions are, are built upon... Um, the conclusion of verse 5 and also verses 1 and 2, uh, these two questions that he's asking here as he gives us an example on, on how ridiculous it is for humans to try to judge rightly uh, one another uh, because uh, we all have sin in our own lives. So he says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but do not consider the plank in your own eye. Now, the speck there describes a either a sliver or a little piece of wood, whether it's like a sawdust splinter of some sort, but it's considered small and in, irrelevant. Though it's still sin, but it's small in comparison to the plank or a log which was used at the time of Jewish culture was either for the framing of the roof or the foundation of the building. And so it was a big log. It was something that could hold some weight. Though it's still sin, but it was bigger than the splinter in a sense. Not that it was worse, but it had to be dealt with first before you would deal with the splinter. Both are sin, one is a speck, the other one is a plank. The one with the plank suggests that his sin is, is not necessarily uh, the biggest, but it needs to be considered first before you move on to try to remove the splinter. And, and the issue that Jesus is dealing with really here is the being self-deceived, being self-deceived, because this plank in the eye is so big, how can you see anything else clearly? That's the whole purpose. And so remove the plank from your eye first before you do anything else. If you have that plank, you are self-deceived. You don't really see what's out there uh, and what is really taking place in the lives of others because you first have to look into yourself. We do. We lose sight of our own sins, don't we? I think that we can become self-righteous and look at others and it does make us feel a little bit better that we're not like that person and we become a Pharisee, a religious leader on a corner of a street, you know, saying at least I'm not like that person or that person and I don't do that sin. And I am sure there's sins out there that you don't do and you can, you can find someone that does and say, hey, I don't do that. And it does make us feel a little bit better. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about dealing with our own sins. So the pl plank must first be removed so we can gently remove the speck. <clears throat> I wanted to, Peter, you remember at the end of chapter 21 there, when Peter had denied the Lord and he went back to fishing, he had to <clears throat> repent and turn back to Christ and Christ came and, and said, come back Peter, feed my sheep and so forth. And you remember that Peter all of a sudden asked the Lord, what about that disciple? You remember that part of that story when, when he looked at Jesus and said, what about John? What about him? And Jesus basically said to him, don't worry about him. You worry about yourself. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. You have a plank. Don't worry about others so much. Worry about the plank in your own eye first. Deal with those issues and then you can judge righteously. He goes on in verse 4 with this question, or... How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your eye. Now it's interesting, the word or there is a, a, a basic restatement in the Greek of verse 3 to emphasize the obscurity of the whole situation. And so he's really focusing on the fact that, that you can't make a proper judgment at all 
with a plank in your own eye. And then when he says a plank in your own eye, that word own is emphatic in the Greek. And so he's, he's basically speaking to them and saying, in your own eye. And he's, he, he's making sure they understand in your own eye. And he's looking at everyone saying, you have to look at the plank. Don't keep looking at splinters. Look at your own plank before you do anything else. Jesus' word here, spec, is not specific, but we can take from it small objects, something less, something that doesn't fit, something that shouldn't be there, totally uh, understandable, whether it's the gospel, whether it's sin, and what kind of sins he doesn't really say. And I think he leaves that up to the Holy Spirit for each individual to deal with. The plank also is not really... Um, specified as to what kind of plank and so forth, um, what it could be. But whatever it is, it's big enough that it needs to be dealt with first before we can even move on. So he goes on and says in verse 5, hypocrites. Now this is interesting because we've been seeing the word hypocrite used in the Sermon on the Mount quite often. But here it's a little different. Usually when he says hypocrite, he's speaking to the religious leaders, right? But here he's speaking to believers, and he's calling them hypocrites. Now the word hypocrite is still defined the same way as a actor, a stage actor, putting on a different face and so forth. But the context is very important. And in this context, context Jesus does not refer to, as I said, the scribes or the Pharisees, but to those who uh, pass judgment. He's talking about those who are making these judgment calls. And more precisely, the word describes a person who maintains a false appearance of religion. One who appears to be pious or devoted, but really is not. When we're making our judgment calls and we're focusing on others, we can seem like we are righteous people, like we're doing the right thing. And so God must be accepting me even more because I'm literally judging someone to help them out. And that can become a hypocrite. Because we're putting on this appearance that everything is okay with me, everything is wrong with you type of attitude. And so what he's saying here is that we have to be very careful, again, on how we judge. And that when we judge, it's to restore and to encourage and to strengthen those individuals that are struggling with these things. Here the hypocrite is not actually aware of his own misrepresentation. He's not purposely doing it, but he's blinded by it, you know? And so it really does take an effort to, to stop and say, okay, where am I at, Lord, before I just go forward with this situation? Because we can be blinded to it. That's the thing with, with deceptiveness, especially in the believer's life. You don't know it's there unless someone else points it out or unless you make it a habit of saying, okay, am I deceived here in this area, Lord? Is there something that I have to take care of first before I continue on? And that's really a struggle. The, the Bible in itself is a book of self-confrontation. It deals with you as an individual before it deals with anyone else. When I got saved and I read the Sermon on the Mount, as, as I shared with you in the past, uh, that sermon convicted me of my sins because I realized that I had a lot of hatred towards people. And Jesus talked about hatred and that we shouldn't hate. In fact, we should love our enemies. And I thought, wow. I knew at that moment, I'm going to hell. It talked about lusting. If you lust for a woman, then you've committed adultery. I've never committed adultery. And yet, I've committed adultery in my heart, Jesus said. I thought, wow, I'm going to hell. The Bible is a book of self-confrontation. It really is. And we have to take it that way. It's not a book to point out the sins of others. It's not taken that way. It's to deal with our own hearts. There's a book called uh, that I use quite often in counseling. In fact, when we do our foundational class, uh, Victories in the Battle of Life is a self-confrontational book. And throughout the years, I've used these books to deal with marriage situations and other situations because it's always dealing with self first, even in relationships of marriages. You have two individuals and they're making judgment calls all the time. What is right? What is wrong? How should we live? How should we not live? Who says you get to do that? Who says I can't do that? And they're just constant battling because they're focusing on others' sins and not their own sins. And it really comes down to our own sins. I know what saves my marriage. 
The thing that saved my marriage was focusing on myself and saying, I need to be loving, and that means sacrificing. That means willing to give in, willing to humble myself. But see, that saves marriages, but if you're not willing to do that, your marriage is going to be in shambles because it takes two to do that. And I don't care how right the other individual is. You can say, oh, they're, they're right, and they've done this right and done that right, but they're not willing to humble. And if they even stand on the word of God with everything that they have, but this is what the word of God says, I know that. But you're not willing to humble yourself. It's not going to work. It's just not going to work. But I've got to apply the word. I, you do have to apply the word. But if they're not applying the word, then you apply the word that says humble yourself. You know, Jesus could have said, hey, the word of God says to love me. Why are you crucifying me? The, the law says you can't crucify me because I'm not guilty of anything. I should be getting down there and you should be letting me down. And, and, but what did he do? He humbled himself. He was illegally hung on that cross. He was not a criminal, but he humbled himself. He could have easily said, I'm God. What are you doing? But he didn't. So he didn't apply, he didn't allow the certain words of the God apply to him when it came to justice and mercy and all those things. He took it all. That's sacrifice. Even when you know that the other person is wrong, you sacrifice yourself for the sake of the relationship and the growth of that individual. It means giving up some rights. It means giving up some things that you think uh, should be happening even. And that will be the, um, the catalyst or, or the thing that, that flourishes your relationship. And that's something that I have uh, had to learn throughout the years to give up what I think is right and think more of my wife in sacrificing my own wants and needs. So he says, first remove the plank from your own eye, which is, again, the appropriate perspective to have. Little humorous story, a woman was complaining about her neighbor's windows being dirty. So she complained to a friend, so she gossiped, hey, neighbor's windows are all dirty, she ought to wash them, you know? I, every time I look out my windows, I see her windows all dirty and so forth. And the friend's, friend said to her, why don't you wash your, your own windows, you know, and see what happens. And so she decided, okay, I'll go home and wash my own windows. And it was funny that after she washed her windows, she went to her friends, hey, uh, neighbors wash their windows too, you know? No, you washed your windows which was really the dirty windows. And you could see that your neighbor's windows were actually clean windows. You know, starts with us first. Starts with us first. Remove the bean from our own eyes. Romans 2, again, as I said earlier, you are inexcusable, O man. Whoever you are who judge, and whatever you judge, you judge another, and you condemn yourself. Now he goes on to verse 6 to close up, which you might think, well, what does that have to do with judging? Especially judging rightly. Because you have a scripture verse here that kind of doesn't fit when he says, do not give what is holy to the dogs. Um, <clears throat> oops, sorry, didn't go back to Matthew. Wanted to read that all in, in its context there. <clears throat> do not give what is holy to the dogs or cast your pearls before swines, lest they trample them on their feet and turn and tear you to pieces or in pieces here. What does that have to do with judging? Well, he is talking about sharing the gospel message or the truth or peace or right judging with others. And there are times where your judgment calls may be wasted in a sense, may be just cast before, as he says here, as a holy item to dogs that really don't care. These are scavengers. Uh, they just roam the land. They weren't used for anything. They weren't tame. Usually if you had a tamed animal, uh, they would be used for hunting. But this animal just ate whatever was thrown out to them and roamed the land. And you're here trying to make judgment calls on their life. You need Jesus Christ. You need to stop what you're doing. Your life is reckless. And, and I'm trying to share with you, trying to help you. And they're just kind of like, I don't want it. I don't need it. And so just leave me alone. And that's taking something holy and you're throwing it before them when they don't really want it. And that's a waste of effort because the individual is not really seeking to be restored with Jesus, nor do they want to be restored to Jesus. It's like casting your pearls before swines. 
Uh, swines, again, were just uh, animals that were out there. Again, Jewish, you don't care for swines. It's unkosher. You're not going to eat swines. They just roamed around, wild animals. And you take pearls, which are valuable, and you cast them to swines, and they're, they're just going to either chew on them and spit them out, crunch on them, lay on them in the mud, and so forth. There's no value to them at all to them, and so they don't care about it. And so you take the gospel, you take whatever judgment calls and whatever help that you're trying to give, and they don't want it. We had gone witnessing to, to the Riverside uh, bus station uh, years ago. And I remember one guy had a track and he was sharing with this guy. And he's walking with him. He's sharing with him Jesus. And as he's walking, he says, here, here's a track. Take it with you. You can read it while you're on the bus. And the guy gets it, crumbles it up, and throws it on the ground. And so the guy then picks up the track and unfolds it. And he's still walking with him. Here, come on, take this with you, you know. He gets it again, crumbles it. He did it like four times. Finally, I, I went over there and I go, hey, Stop casting your pearls before swines. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. Another example, and this is where it, it would probably more relate with us because we deal with it all the time. We deal with family members that aren't believers. <clears throat> and I have. <clears throat> and you're sharing the gospel with them. They don't want it. They don't want it. And so you're always sharing, looking for opportunities. And there's a point where all of a sudden now you're becoming a pest. And so now they're making little sly remarks towards you. They don't like you. They ostracize you. They kind of put you in the corner or whatever. And, and, and now you're just, you know, uh, pearls before swines. I think you have to be careful. You know, share the gospel with them very clearly, you know, lovingly, compassionately. And, and if there's an interest, great. But if not, then just live your life before them. Stop casting your pearls before swines because eventually they're going to resent you and, and not uh, want to hang around you. I know my mom was sharing the gospel with my brother and, and she would be very bold because she loves him very much and so every, every time they met she would just share something and eventually he gets so angry he'd just leave. And, and so he got, finally he got so angry and says, Mom, I can't, I, can't, uh, I can't hang around you anymore. Sorry. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to be around you. So it's been at least two, three years that he has not even spoken to my mother because you know, she just overdid it. And I tried to share with her, you can't do that, Mom. You need to, you need to just live it in front of him. Yeah, but I, w I want to see him going to hell. I don't want to, you know, because she just loves him so much and she knows he's going. And so she's thinking she can convince him. And she can't. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that does that. Now saying that, <clears throat> we need to take every opportunity to make right judgment calls on who is worthy to receive the gospel and who's not. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying worthy in that they're righteous and pious enough to enter heaven. I'm saying if they're willing to receive and to hear. You know, I, had fa I have a family member that when I go over to Virginia's side of the family, she's always sitting with me and asking me questions. And I just love it because I love answering biblical questions and, and talking with her about that. And so we'll sit for hours, usually the whole time, just talking about biblical things. You know, where, where I have other family members that won't sit with me at all uh, because they don't want to hear it. You know, and so I've just learned to, to give to the person that's worthy to hear it and the person that's not, I just won't give it anymore. You know, let the dead bury the dead as the Bible says. So, so use wise judgment righteously when you make your judgments. We all make them. We all make them. And I think that we should make them. I think we need to stand up and turn this country around and, and stop uh, believing in this tolerance thing and have true tolerance, uh, what is right and what is truth, and live that before those around us.